Hey everybody, I am Mike with Mike's Affordable Scuba. And every so often people ask me what made me get into scuba. And I've talked about it with quite a few people. Uh, in fact, I wrote a little article about it. I share it with almost every student because I want them to understand the gravity of how amazing scuba can be for you. So this is actually more of a law enforcement employment story than it is a scuba story. Um, starts off when I was a kid. My dad had uh, some scuba gear. He was in like the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere in there. He, he, uh, he was working for the Lenexa Fire Department in the Kansas City area. And he was on their dive team. Well, diving was not all that evolved back then. So when he brought home his gear, he set it in the hallway. And I got curious. I went in there and I was about probably six, five, somewhere in there. He uh, just left it in the hallway, and I went over and started playing with it and touching stuff. And you know, I, uh, obviously, I didn't know what any of that stuff was. The extent of what I knew in this world at that time was I liked peanut butter with honey on bread, and Ninja Turtles were pretty awesome. <clears throat> so I start touching stuff, and all of a sudden, I turned a hand wheel on an accident on a scuba tank, and it turned on the air. Uh, it wasn't hooked up to a regulator, so it started hissing, and it was real loud, and, you know, for a four or five or however old I was kid, it was pretty in, uh, loud and intense, and probably one of the most intense things I've ever experienced in my young life at that point. Uh, so I did what any responsible kid would do at that age. I ran downstairs and started playing Nintendo and acted like I had no idea what was going on. So, fast forward, uh, I don't want to give away the names or the agency, but I was working for a police department in the Springfield, Missouri area. Not Springfield Police Department, but in the area. And really, it was a pretty good agency. It just, it had a couple really terrible supervisors and really terrible chain of command and management uh, with that being said I actually certified a sergeant from there and he is an awesome guy so it's not like across the board they're all bad just a couple really bad chain of command people um, that's not to say corrupt so much as just piss poor human beings so we're going to call this guy Sergeant because he was a sergeant. And uh, years earlier, I'd worked for Reed Springs Police Department. And the chief at the time, Aaron Hart, and the sheriff at the time, Doug Rader, were having a pissing match. And they were constantly at each other. And it led to the sheriff saying, if you... Uh, want any any patrols or any investigation or fill in gaps or mutual aid of any kind you're going to fire the chief end of story so the city fired the chief because the city has a limited budget and the sheriff's office can always fill in and respond to calls for service so there was that and uh so uh there was a alderman at the time who happened to down the road become the the sergeant at this police department and i don't know the truth of it because i don't really know him that well but i was told that he had no prior law enforcement experience before taking a position as a sergeant at this police department that he was a security guard for years at a uh, college and that's all the experience he had and every college student that I've met has told me that he's a total bully that knows him so 
Uh, fast forward to give you an idea of what kind of guy this guy is. There was a raid on a house uh, in that city and warrants are very specific. Uh, I know that the Mar-a-Lago Trump FBI raid is popular in the news now, so something you may have learned is that warrants have to be specific. They tell you where you can go, where you can't go, and what you can seize and what you cannot seize. The only exception to that is basically what's called plain sight. If you see it and it's obviously a law violation, then you can collect that evidence just like you could if you were on a traffic stop or just happened to wander into someone's home on a call for service. If there's a bag of weed sitting on the coffee table, guess what? It's fair play. So this sergeant, and it's been a while since I knew this story, so I might get a little bit messed up, but he basically arrested a guy. Uh, handcuffed him, brought him over, leaned him against the car, and uh, then someone said, oh, I got a guy over here in this storage shed, and the storage shed was being used as a residence. Uh, and... I think I was told it had a uh, blanket or a towel or something for a door and they heard movement inside and uh, everyone was like police come on out this is the police come talk to us come out and big bad sergeant rips the towel off the door walks on in grabs the guy yanks him out and total violation of the uh, parameters of that warrant that had nothing to do with a storage shed nothing to do with it being an arrest warrant it was a search warrant for property not an arrest warrant to arrest whoever is in this shed and I, I don't want to give anybody this idea that I'm saying police are corrupt uh, I think that most issues with law enforcement tend to come from the fact that they just don't know and they're in a spot where you have to act and you can't sit around and read a book for 20 minutes that you might not have or Google something in the moment. So this guy is basically the worst I've ever met. And I've known thousands of cops. So this guy yanks this guy out and uh, total no-go. Everyone's telling him don't do it, and he's basically like, oh, I'm a sergeant, I can do what I want. And uh, so guess what happens to the guy that he left hanging out with the handcuffs by the police car? He ran off. Because that's what bad guys do when you arrest them and then leave them unattended. So he made a trainee write a report about what happened and the trainee said the truth that this sergeant left him unattended and the guy escaped well guess what sergeants are part of the review process for the reports he read the report and said uh, uh, well trainee if you don't change this then good luck keeping your job. I'm going to make sure you get fired. So she changes it and then she gets brought into a ethics review board with a chief and a couple captains and a lieutenant and they say, why'd you do this? And, you know, not wanting to look like she lied on a report to cover for the sergeant, which she was coerced to do. Um, she says, I don't know. I made a mistake. I'm sorry. And they say, well, unfortunately, this is a pretty big mistake. So now you're fired. She gets upset. She starts crying. And she says, uh, it wasn't me. It was the sergeant. It was the sergeant. He did it. And he told me that if I didn't change the report, then I was going to be fired. And I don't want to be fired. So I did what he told me to do. And they said, well, that sounds awful suspicious. I don't know if we believe that. And... Uh, so uh, she says, well, ask anybody who was there. So they go and ask everybody, and and uh, turns out it's true. Did anything happen to the sergeant? No, because he was buddies with the chief at the time, and the chief covered for him. Didn't get fired, didn't get suspended, didn't get a write-up, didn't get nothing. He just, hey, Sarge, you might not want to do that next time. 
So that's an idea of what type of guy this was. And he is not, uh, he's, he's just not ethical. And he thinks that he can do anything he wants because he has the badge. So he's the kind of guy that really gives cops a bad name. Um, fast forward to me specifically. Uh, a couple detectives said, hey, I think I'm going to go to the new restaurant over here and the new Mexican restaurant. And so Sergeant pops his head out the door and says, hey, guys, I could go for some tacos, too. And at this point, everybody in the agency's lost respect for this guy. Nobody trusts him. Nobody likes him because, yeah, I mean, he's cops work really hard to be trustworthy and have a good reputation and earn community support. And single-handedly, this guy regularly does things to upend that. It's, he's chaos. So, um, he uh, says that he's wanting to go get tacos too, and they basically <laughs> look him in the face and say, Sorry, bro, you're not invited. So, um, so uh, uh, Sergeant, so the Sergeant um gets pissed and he's in his office and he's mfering everybody under his breath and uh then he screams mccoy get in here and i go running in moving sergeant what can i do for you sergeant like a good little trooper and uh <laughs> he he looks me in the eye and says why don't you like me mccoy and i was like say like, what and he says, you heard me. Why don't you like me? And I was like, what makes you think I don't like you, sir? Now, the truth is I didn't like him. Nobody likes him because he's unethical and he's he's a terrible human being. Um, so, I, you know, I was still going to be respectful. He's still my supervisor. And I said, Sergeant, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, what makes you think I don't like you? And he says, don't think I don't know that every time that you come in here and we talk about whatever and I review your performance, your reports that you don't run out there and run your mouth to all your little friends. I said, my little friends, you mean my, my coworkers? <laughs> he says, don't think you, uh, that I don't know what you do, McCoy. Um, and, uh, I was like, well, can you give me an example, Sergeant? And he says, I don't write this stuff in my fucking diary at night. And I said, well, I mean, if you can't give me an example, then I can't help you. And uh, he gets more infuriated and starts talking about how um, if uh, that there's a problem with respect in this department. It ends right now and it's going to end with me first. Oh, great. Lucky me. So... Uh, sergeant starts running his mouth, yelling at me, getting all pissed. And I was like, look, Sergeant, if you can't come up with one good example of something I actually did to you, then there's, there's nothing for me to apologize for. And there's nothing I can do to change it. And you're kind of on your own here. And he gets pissed, spits in my face rears back to punch me and uh that that's when my corporal comes in whoa 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 stop 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 and he catches grim about uh, the sergeant catches the sergeant about to punch me in the face and uh so i explain to him what's going on and the sergeant uh, says that I've disrespected him and that I've got to go. And I looked at the sergeant and I basically said, if you think people don't like you and that people talk badly about you, maybe you should look at your behavior right now. You are literally about to punch me and you spit on me. Maybe there's a reason people don't respect you. 
I, I knew I was asking to get fired as soon as I said that, but, you know, I kind of felt like in the moment that that was something that needed to be said. So I, uh, I handed, uh, no, sorry, back up. Um, he starts screaming about how I need to give him my gun and my badge. And at this point, I think I'm going to be fired. So I, I kind of, uh, I was a smart ass about it and I handed him my badge. Here you go. And then I said, okay, here's my gun. It's a $1,400 gun. It was a Sig Sauer 226 Extreme. They're pretty pricey, valuable guns. And it had a TRL-1 or something like that. Uh, oh, no, it was an X300 Surefire flashlight on it. So and it was loaded with Hornady critical duty rounds, which are also kind of expensive. So the whole thing was a lot of money. And he's like, give me your gun and your badge. Like it was some cheesy 50s movie and i was like well here's my badge but you gotta give me a 1400 hundred dollar deposit if you're gonna keep my gun because i own it it's not department issued and he screams get the fuck out of here mccoy and so i leave um i start collecting my gear he screams that i'm fired and i need to hurry up and get everything get out and uh uh, so I'm collecting all my stuff out of my locker, at my desk, out of my cubby, uh, out of my patrol car. I, I got everything that I owned. I left a few things behind, like my badge and collar brass and things that uh, the city owned. And my ID cards, my door cards, everything. I went home, and on my way home, I called the chief, and I'm like, Hey, chief, just to let you know, this is exactly what happened. And... Uh, Chief says, well, take five days off, come back, and we'll review the situation and discuss it with you when you get back. So I come back, and uh, uh, I have my meeting, my ethics review board, where I talk to everybody, and I explain what happened. And um, Well, you know, of course the sergeant made it like it was all my fault. And uh, he says... Um, well, this is all McCoy. He was disrespectful. He, uh, started the whole thing. And then the chief looks at him and says, hold on, let me cut to the chase. You can't fire people just because they don't like you, Sergeant. And he looks at me and says, but it looks like you also did some things wrong. And I was like, I don't know what I did. I mean, I was a bit of a smart ass when I thought I was getting fired, but clearly I I didn't think that there was anything that I did to create this situation. So, but, you know, I'm a good little trooper, so I just kept it to myself. Uh, they tell me, that's enough, McCoy. You can go back to work now. Here's your badge. Uh, go make some traffic stops or whatever cops do during their work day. Uh, so I go back. I'm in the squad room. I'm working on <clears throat> a report that I had hanging the entire week I was suspended. I did get paid for my week off though because I was found to be in the right. Uh, so that's nice. Um, so uh, then uh, all of a sudden the sergeant comes out and he's all happy and grinning and stuff and he's like, I didn't get you this time, but don't worry. We have a plan. We're gonna get you next time. And in my head, I'm like, we, we're? That means he concocted a plan with the chief and the other people who are in charge. So my time is now officially limited. I was probably led to keep my job so that I can't sue the city for punch uh, him about to punch me and spitting in my face, which I should have. I didn't because you sue a police department or a city, you'll probably never get a cop job again because now they know that you might sue them. So I didn't, I let it go. Uh, I kept working, I hoped that something would happen. Uh, and then one of our other officers ended up joining the National Guard or the reserves, one or the other, as an infantryman doing something noble and brave and important for the defense of our country. And 
While he was gone, the chief wanted to hire one of his buddies that quit uh, another agency. And so he was going to fire the guy who was gone for military service for basic training and, well, OSUT. And uh, I was like, hey, I'm, I'm not trying to be a dick here, but guess what? You can't legally fire him when he's gone for military training and going to come back. You have to give him his same job back or one of equal uh, position and pay, and you can't let him go. Uh, and they were like, well, who are you to know that? And I'm like, well, I was a guy that was in the active army and then the National Guard. That's how I know. And they were like, oh, well, we're going to talk to our city attorney about that. And they did. And guess what? I was right. But now they had to get rid of someone else. I was coming up from uh, Fayetteville, Arkansas one night and I got stopped in a uh, city. I was in the back seat. I had full blown flu. Uh, I was very sick, and we just came through Cape Fair, I think it was, wind, very windy roads, and I hung my head out the window, and I threw up from the back seat while my dad was driving. So, yeah, totally embarrassing. I had vomit all over my car, gross, humiliating, terrible stuff, but, I mean, I was sick, and I didn't want to throw up in my own car. So... This rookie cop who happens to be the son of a very close friend of mine uh, who I worked with in my first year as a cop pulls me over and he says, uh, he pulls my dad out, starts doing field sobriety testing because he thinks that my dad's drunk. Guess what? My dad hasn't had a drink since I was like two. Uh, so he doesn't do drugs. He doesn't even smoke cigarettes. I, I think at the time his only vice he had was he bought guitars. Um, so, yeah, good good luck. Well, unfortunately, he was not taking the test very seriously. Kind of like a mentality of, uh, I'm not drunk, so the cop's going to recognize that and he's going to let me go. Easy peasy. And so I uh, shouted, hey, you need to stop doing that field sobriety test right now and ask for a portable breath test. And he did. And the, I presume, because he doesn't drink, that his PBT came back as triple zeros, meaning no alcohol on board. And then uh, the guy was like, this can't be right. So he did it again. Triple zeros, I presume. And the guy, uh, the backup from the county comes strolling up and he's like, hey, I hear you uh, said you were in an emergency and needed backup now because you were in danger. So here I am. And, you know, me and Matt are sitting on the curb and my dad's over there being talked to. And uh, for, the, for the full sake of transparency, we were in kilts because we came from a Scottish event called the Burns Night. So basically three dudes in dresses with knives on our socks being pulled over in the middle of the night, which is a little embarrassing. Um, so uh, the next day, literally hours later, I let my corporal know um, his patrol car didn't start that day, is broken, so I went and picked him up from home. Uh, and I was like, hey, I gotta let you know I was in a traffic stop yesterday because it's city policy. I let you know about any off duty contacts with law enforcement. Uh, and he says, well, did, were you speeding? I said, no, I was in the back seat. And he says, oh, did you get in trouble or arrested or anything? I said, no, I was in the back seat. And he says, who got the ticket? And I was like, my dad. And he says, Oh, well, that's got nothing to do with you, so who cares? And we went on with life. A couple days later, Ethics Review Board again. Hey, Mike, come on in here. Let's have a talk. Do you have any uh, contact with police lately? Mm, oh, yeah, there was a thing where... Uh, 
uh, my dad got a ticket. And he goes, yeah, about that. We got a call, and apparently you were interfering with his investigation. And I was like, well, I mean, yeah, I guess technically, but uh, for valid reasons. I mean, I'm not going to let my dad go to uh, jail on DWI and have to pay for lawyers and all this other stuff for no reason. I mean, he was absolutely sober. He doesn't drink. And chief and captain look at me and say, well, that's the kind of thing you handle in court. Very stereotypical cop thing to say. But it's my dad. And... Me knowing what's going on, that this guy was trying to railroad us, and actually it gave us a 20 mile over the speed limit ticket later as a cover his ass ticket. Um, so, so I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to let my dad get railroaded. I mean, if he was actually drunk, then whatever. That's, that's his fault. But he wasn't. And this dude was totally going to take him to jail on a D-dub. Because he wanted the stat. So, yeah, I, I stopped it. With legitimate means and reasons. So, and I'll stand before any judge and, and admit that. Um, and in fact, because rookie officers rarely do SFSTs correctly, that PBT was probably a much more accurate test. So, uh, they fire me for uh, failing to report an off-duty law enforcement contact, to which I said, yes, I did report it to my corporal. Well, why do you report it to the corporal? Because he's my first-line supervisor. That's how chain command works. Lowest guy reports to the next lowest guy, and it goes up the chain. And if they have anything to say, then it comes back down the chain. Ask me how I know after nine years of military service and at that time around like seven or 11 or something years of cop work. So uh, he says, well, we're firing you anyway. Um, I do recommend that you uh, do a peer review so that you can keep your job. And I was like, no, come on. After all of that, I don't even want this job anymore. Deuces, I'm out. Here's my badge. Here's my stuff. Goodbye. And I left. And um, so all the all the dealing with this sergeant had created a lot of medical problems. Like my blood pressure was ridiculously high all the time. I felt like I was having cardiac events like all the time. I blacked out. From the stress every weekend was hey let's go to uh, uh, the hospital because I feel like crap and I can't catch my breath and turns out it was just panic attacks every weekend I'd, I'd say oh my god two more days until I have to go back to work and deal with this guy one more day till I have to go back and deal with this guy oh god I've got four days of work until I have a day off away from this guy. I got two days of work until, and it was just a repetitive thing. Like, like this dude consumed my life because he was so aggressive with me constantly that people would crack jokes about how I got on this guy's bad side, all because from the beginning of the story, I supported Aaron Hart, the chief of uh, Reed Springs, that had nothing to do with this city so i uh, on my birthday 2018 i walk into a local scuba store and i say hey how much is it to learn how to dive oh it's going to be 699 dollars for the certification plus we need you to uh, pay another $85 per a day for a minimum of five days uh, to have rental gear. And we need you to drive all the way down an hour way to Beaver Lake at least three days in a row. Uh, we recommend you get a hotel room so that you don't have to drive down there in the morning and maybe be late. Uh, you'll need to feed yourself while you're there. Um, <clears throat> 
don't forget, you also have to buy mask fin snorkel boots. That's going to be $300. Um, what else? Uh, we also recommend that you get your own regulators because, you know, people get sick and you don't want to be putting other people's regulators in your mouth. Never mind, instead of buying regulators, I could have just bought a $5 mouthpiece. So, uh, I mean, they really racked the bill up on me. And I was like, okay, all this stuff you want me to buy, the wetsuits, the BCDs, uh, all this stuff. How much are we talking here? And he says, oh, you know, minimum couple grand. But I think it's safe to say around $6,000. I'm like, whoa, I work in government. That ain't going to happen. So I walk out and I'm telling a friend, hey, Burrow, this is where it gets scooby. Finally, after half an hour, um, I really want to learn how to scuba dive. I think it'd be awesome. Great stress reliever. And at this point, I had no idea how good of a stress reliever. And uh, he says, hey, you know, uh, Lewis Chapman. And I said, he's the uh, airport police chief right and he goes yeah and I'm like yeah I think I met him during a conference on K2 and bath salts like a million years ago yeah that's how long ago um, when zombies roamed the earth so I call this dude up and I'm like hey Lewis long time no see and he goes you're a cop aren't you and I go yeah and I said well I'm trying to get open water certified uh, what how much is it going to be and I'm sitting there thinking, oh, God, brace for the worst, brace for the worst. And he goes, oh, yeah, I'll do it. If you're a cop. I'll do it for 200 bucks. 200 bucks. Suddenly it's affordable, you know. So I go and do that. And then I start working with uh, Wonders of Wildlife as a volunteer. And they're like, oh, you can get trained to swim with these sharks. I'm like, say what? These fools are crazy. Guess what? I like swimming with sharks now. Uh, they also said if you want to get uh, uh, your full face mask certification, then you can do like, I don't know what you'd call it, but like uh, speaking engagements, kind of like underwater tours where you're feeding fish or whatever, and then guests come in and you can say, hey, this is a... Uh, Goliath grouper, this is a sturgeon, this is a catfish, and they grow to this, and they eat this, and, you know, it's good engagement with people that try to get them interested in conservationism. So I was like, well, my job is to clean tanks, and that's not super exciting, so heck yeah, I'm gonna go get that certification. I go down, I'm like, hey, buddy, hey, Lewis, what's up? Uh, shout out to White River Dive Company, since that's where I got my real start. And uh, uh, in Branson, Missouri. And I was like, hey, I, I'm over at Wonders of Wildlife. Do you think that you can give me full face mask? And he does. So now I am, and now I can do that at Wonders of Wildlife. But... Um, <clears throat> I, I didn't really feel like aquarium diving was real diving at the time. Never mind. Now I know that, you know, that's probably the best conditions in Missouri, truthfully. Um, so I give that up and uh, then I'm like, hey, you know, I'm a cop. So maybe I could do search and recovery diver so that if there's evidence or something in the lake, I can go get it. And uh, he's like, yeah, sure. He doesn't tell me that that's actually a public safety diver, an entire different thing. But I found out later on that search and recovery is more like I dropped my heirloom fishing pole or my cell phone in the lake and <laughs> go get me my cell phone back. So it's still cool. I mean, that's, that's awesome. I made a lot of money on that over the years. Um and it's a challenge, like you just have no idea how cool it is to go in the water and you're searching for a cell phone, something that's like seven inches by four inches in a lake 
it's such a challenge. And they're like, there's no way I'm going to find this thing. And, you know, when they drop in, they catch the water and then they like sail away. So, uh, awesome gig. And then I was like, you know, I think I kind of want to try this wreck diver thing. And, and, you know, it's not like we got any pirate ships and tiny coma over table rock. Well, it turns out there is, I mean, not pirate ships, but there's, there's some, some wrecks down here. So I go and do that. I'm checking out the wrecks. Um, and, you know, he keeps giving me these phenomenal deals on classes. Like it's a wreck divers, like a, I think it's like a $200 class. And he did it for like $75 because I'm a cop. So I'm like part of the brotherhood. <clears throat> so, so we, uh, keep taking classes over and over and he's like, Hey, you're getting pretty close to having your, your master diver. And I'm like, what's that? And master diver is basically you get five certifications. I think it's 60 dives and uh, a few specific ones. You have to be at least advanced open water with rescue. So then he's like, Hey, you should do rescue and you should do oxygen provider and all these other cool things. So I do. Does he give me such great deals on it? Why would I say no? And then he says, Hey, you seem to like diving quite a bit. Why don't you uh, think about being a dive master? And he's, and I'm like, I thought I was uh, like almost a dive master. And he says, no, 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 there's a difference. Master diver in the PADI network is basically just a certification level. But dive master is the first level of being a professional diver, like where you can make money as a diver. And I said, sign me up. And so I did an internship. I thought. I actually paid for it up front. And then at the end of the uh, summer, he's like, hey, you did really good this year. So yeah, you did your internship and it's not going to cost you anything. And I'm like, but I already paid. And he says, that sucks. But you're now you're going to be a dive master. So the benefit of being an intern dive master was I got to dive a lot. I, I like diving. Um, air is $88 to, to fill up a tank or $10 to rent a tank. And that adds up. Uh, driving adds up. Um, you get hungry after you dive. So eating every day after a dive, it adds up. And now I'm getting this $600 class for free. Uh, I'm diving a lot. I'm, I'm learning things every day. I'm learning new stuff about how to teach a skill or, or recognize a problem. And it just kept going and going and going. And then, uh, after like a year and a half or whatever, of volunteering as a dive master after getting my internship done uh lewis says hey look i i don't mind having you here but i'm paying you a lot of money to be a dive master and most dive masters in this country don't make what you're making so i really need you to think about being an instructor because i can't keep paying you this much to be a dive master and i'm like that's fair so I find out that uh, what I was involved with going to instructor school, it's called uh, the IDC instructor development course. I went to Rainbow Reef in Key Largo, Florida. They are rated as the number one PADI uh, instructor development center in the entire world. Um, they process more instructor candidates than anywhere in the world. and. Yeah, that's kind of impressive, but it's also kind of not because it, it's really kind of a, a scuba instructor mill and they just pump them out. But at the same time, they've really refined it. And I find that I have better skills than a lot of other instructors. And I'm not, I'm not just trying to brag. I'm not trying to be better than anyone else. They're definitely definitely better instructors out there than me but at the same time 
like I learned little things that that nobody else seems to do and it's shout out to Josh Cohen and and Josh Childress who were my uh, course directors they they taught me things that nobody else has ever heard of they've taught me things that have really benefited me everything down to how to descend down a line without losing somebody uh, which sounds like something you should learn in IDC anyway but uh, their technique is has been foolproof um, they taught me so Rainbow Reef may or may not be perfect and they may or may not have all the best people or rude people or polite people or you know whatever you say about Rainbow Reef is whatever you think and that's your business to have that opinion uh, but the Joshes and Kel Levendorf were excellent uh, they were great people I still to this day admire all three of them very much um, they made me into what I think and like I said, I'm not just being braggadocious, but I think I'm a pretty damn good instructor for scuba. And and there's other influences too. Lewis was a great influence. Um, the Joshes and Kel were great influences. All the dive masters on the boats that I've taken out, they say something, they do something, and I'm like, oh, that makes sense. All the students I've had over the years, uh, I've refined my techniques by saying one thing to somebody and them freaking out or them getting really excited or them understanding versus not understanding. So over time, I've really refined my techniques based on the reactions of other people and trying to get the most positive response possible. So... I think I'm a pretty good instructor, and I definitely thank Lewis so much because he gave me that opportunity to be a full-time dive instructor at a lake, not in an ocean. And diving and learning in a lake makes stronger divers. Uh, you can say otherwise. You, the diving may not be as fun or as pretty, but it makes stronger divers for a fact. Um, I see ocean divers who have 200 plus dives, they get in the lake and they panic and freak out. And it's nothing I can do, it's partially their arrogance level that they think that being an ocean diver they're equipped, but then they descend five feet and it's brown and they freak out. Not to say everybody does, but it happens quite a bit. So, at this point now, I am a full-fledged scuba open water instructor. I go through all the requirements to become a uh, master scuba diver trainer. And then I go back and I do what's called an audit, where I watch how an instructor development course is taught at, Re at uh, Key Largo, uh, Rainbow Reef. And so I'm, I'm not, I am a student, but I'm also kind of an instructor. Uh, I get to watch how it's done. I get to teach some classes to the new instructors. And I do that a couple times. And I earned my staff instructor rating. Currently, I am waiting for an opportunity to be able to teach three assistant instructor courses. Uh, which doesn't go very well because it's part of the cost of becoming an instructor. So why would you take an assistant instructor class if you're just going to be an instructor because it's part of the cost as well. So nobody wants to do assistant instructor. And I can't move up until I do. But that's my story. Um, that's how I got to where I am. And then... I don't want to go into the details of what happened at White River, but not Lewis. He's amazing. He's a hero and an amazing person who I respect very much. But another coworker there 
made me realize that my time is spent better somewhere else. I left and I thought, man, it'd be awesome to have my own shop. And so I started buying gear and putting it aside and building a, a rental inventory and buying a little bit of retail inventory and and here I am, owner of Mike's Affordable Scuba. It's a long process. This has been a long story. We're at 45 and a half minutes now. And I appreciate everyone that wants to take this journey with me and everybody who wants to be certified by me, everybody who has cheered me on along the way. I really appreciate it very much. You've been phenomenal for my career. Thank you so much. And that is how Mike got into scuba. Have a great day. Come dive with us. It's great diving at great prices at Mike's Affordable Scuba.